Uh, yeah, a big box of them, I'm sure. Mm. Okay. Well, good evening. I'm told that we are live, and so we're going to go ahead and begin. It is a joy and an honor for me to be able to be with you for this course in the uh, Georgia School of Preaching. It is a continuation of Hebrew history. I don't know if the technical course numbers would be Hebrew history 1 and 2 and so forth. I'm not exactly sure how that lays or, or plays out. But we are dealing with the books of First and Second Samuel, as you can see on the screen to my left. And uh, we're picking up where we left off last winter and last spring with uh, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Uh, I know most all of you, there are some new faces this time from uh, the last course, but my name is Cliff Goodwin. I come to you from Talladega, Alabama. I labor uh, locally with the Ironiton Church of Christ. I've been there 20 27 years I've been at Ironiton now and uh, been teaching in the Georgia School of Preaching as somewhat of an adjunct for about five or six years, give or take a, a, a year maybe. But anyway, the privilege is mine. I'm glad to be here with you. And uh, we have a lot to go over as we begin this new course. And so we'll get right to that in a moment. But before we do, let's start with a word of prayer together. Bow with me. Almighty God in heaven, Father, we come as thy children. We come, Father, so thankful for this opportunity to involve our hearts and our minds in a study of thy word together. Father, we are so thankful for the Edgewood congregation of thy people. We are so grateful, Father, for the Georgia School of Preaching and for all of the training and instruction that this school has provided over the years. Father, we are thankful for each student represented here tonight. We're thankful also for other students, Father, that we anticipate joining us in the weeks to come. Father, we ask that during this course of study that we would exhibit the utmost reverence for thy word. And Father, that we would deal with it faithfully and handle it aright and we ask father for thy blessings upon all of our efforts in this study we pray that thy name would be glorified uh, as a result father of our feeble efforts father we thank you most of all for jesus and it's in his name dear god that we offer these prayers amen Okay, uh, I hope that you have, I trust everyone has a uh, notebook in front of you. Go ahead and open it up. I want to say a thank you to everyone who had a part in copying and then uh, hole punching and ultimately assembling these binders. Uh, this, this is the way I teach First and Second Samuel. It is a little different from the approach and from the format that we use in Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, but it's designed to where when this course is over, you will have an outline on every chapter. Every chapter in 1 Samuel, every chapter in 2 Samuel, Lord willing, Lord willing will have been dealt with, and uh, this binder will be yours thereafter permanently, and you'll have a record of our studies, and hopefully, I hope and trust, that it will be of value to you in the future, uh, maybe for reference and for future studies. 
Now, probably uh, near the front of your binder, I would hope that you have a copy of the syllabus. Let's look over it very briefly, some things that we need to cover. The uh, syllabus and then the class calendar will follow it. Uh, as you can tell, this uh, class is beginning on January 15th. Lord willing, the final exam will be given on April 22nd. And so pretty much uh, four months will occupy or be occupied in our study of First and Second Samuel. I won't read all uh, through this. I know that you can read this for yourselves. But just notice there under the course description, the last line or so, an emphasis on the kingship of Jesus Christ as Messiah will also be discerned in this study. A lot of folks, when they hear the Old Testament, when they hear books like First and Second Samuel, they, uh, they operate with the misunderstanding that uh, such books are not really about Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus made it clear in John 5 and verse 39, he was speaking to a Jewish audience who had no more. They had nothing else at that point in time than the Old Testament as we know it. And Jesus told them in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Well, the only scriptures those folks had at that present moment was the Old Testament scriptures. And yet Jesus made it clear that even those Old Testament scriptures testified of him. And so at times, especially as we make our way through First and Second Samuel, we'll be taking the opportunity to highlight uh, messianic emphases and to point out the fact that Jesus, of course, is the ultimate monarch. He's the ultimate uh, king over God's people. Uh, mo move over with me to the class calendar now. Uh, and this is very important. We did have to make some tweaks. Uh, perhaps some of you might have seen an earlier version of this calendar uh, maybe a, back about a month or six weeks ago, I'm not really sure. But if you have seen an earlier version, be careful to notice that we have made at least one or two changes uh, to the calendar. Beginning tonight on January 15th, uh, the next uh, tonight and I believe the next three sessions as well are all meeting on Monday evenings, uh, which is typical. That's by design. Uh, but do notice that our fifth session... On February 8th, just make a note that that will be a Thursday night meeting. That's the major change from the prior calendar. And that's because, of course, we're starting a week later than what we had thought at one point. And then uh, February 22nd, you'll notice, is another Thursday night meeting. And then we have an entire week off, March 3 through 9. There will be no class sessions that week, and that falls right after the midterm. Our midterm will be an exam over 1 Samuel, and uh, following that then we'll have a week off and we'll pick back up. And you'll notice one more Thursday night class, April 11th, that's actually class meeting number 13. Uh, but beyond that, typically we'll be meeting on Monday evenings here at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, backing up just for a moment, I do need to ask for a show of hands. If you'll back up to the second page of the syllabus where we have the course requirements, uh, if you are taking this course for credit, I need you to raise your hand. If you're taking it for credit. All right, very good. Okay, all right, so we may have as many as three taking it for credit. Uh, that's great. Really and truly, uh, it, you probably can have a little longer if you want to uh, decide that. I don't think you have to set that in stone tonight. But what is important is that you notice the grading summary. Uh, for preacher students, you see that it's a little different. I'll be expecting two sermon outlines, and, and uh, I give some details there regarding those. I'll be uh, requiring them on the day of the final. So that will be April 22nd. Those two outlines will be due. If you're taking it for credit but not as a preacher student, uh, then of course all you'll have is the midterm and the final exams. 
uh, 1 Samuel midterm, 2 Samuel final, and you'll see how the grading breaks down with that. Okay, before I leave the syllabus and the calendar for good, at least tonight, do you have any questions? Are there any questions or any comments or any thoughts on the uh, syllabus for this course? All right, easy enough. Uh, now, let's, let's find in our binders. Let's go ahead and, and get started with the introduction. Uh, you should have a sheet that looks like this. Minus the highlighting and the answers that I have written in on mine, of course. Uh, but let's introduce these two books. Now, as you understand, we know them as First and Second Samuel, but uh, originally they were basically one book. They, they were self-contained as one book, or, or you might even say one scroll, perhaps. But due to the length of the content over time, uh, they came to occupy two books. And thus we know them as 1st and 2nd Samuel. Normally when you start introducing uh, any particular book of the Bible, you want to start by talking about authorship. Uh, I have these verses on your outlines, but I've also got them up on the screen. What we're doing in 1st and 2nd Samuel is we're bridging a gap, a, a historical gap if you'd like to think of it that way. Uh, last course we dealt with Joshua Judges and Ruth, and that was a period in Israel's history uh, well before they had a, an earthly monarchy. Now really, from Sinai onward, Israel by design would have been a theocracy, which really means that they did in fact have a king, but God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, he was Israel's king. Well, as we get into 1 Samuel particularly, we're going to note somewhat of a restlessness on the part of God's people. A restlessness on the part of Israel. And I use that term because they, they don't really think of God as their king. And that, that's very evident at times due to their actions and due to their behaviors and their attitude. But they, they come to Samuel and they want an earthly monarch. They want an earthly king. Well, the books of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, they predate any kind of earthly monarchy for Israel. But the books of First and Second Samuel, they're going to come in next, as it were, and they're going to fill in this gap. And they're going to show us the transition from the period of the judges to the time even of Saul, the first earthly king of Israel. And so these books serve to do that. Now along the way, we're going to learn about certain prophets who also were working and functioning uh, over some of this time period. So look at the first verse here, 1 Chronicles 29, 29. Now the acts of David the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, and in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer. So notice here that even though Samuel, we're probably well familiar with him, there were other prophets who were going to come along, namely Nathan and Gad. And then in the next reference, 2 Chronicles 9.29, I, I won't read all of it, but just highlight the names of Ahijah, the Shiloh Knight, that you'll notice there, and also Iddo, the seer. And so if you count Samuel, we're reading of about as many as five prophets who span the period now, and this is what you need to fill in on your uh, outlines, five prophets who span the period from the judges not merely to the, the, the beginning of the monarchy, as it were, but even to the divided kingdom. When the kingdom was ultimately divided under Rehoboam, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first king over Israel in the north. And so roughly in this order, we're going to be uh, moving through historically the ministries of Samuel, Gad, Nathan, Ahijah and Iddo. Okay? And so those are five prophets who span the period.
from the judges to the divided kingdom. Now, what does that mean or what does that help us with regarding the authorship of the book? Well, the best we can tell, the best I can tell at least, the books we know today as First and Second Samuel were perhaps penned by Samuel, obviously, but then there are a lot of events that are recorded after Samuel's death uh, in these books. And so also Gad and or Nathan are likely candidates uh, who might have been the inspired penmen for these two books, First and Second Samuel. Now, that they would have been written probably or approximately over a span of 60 to 100 years. Now, we, we say that because we, we like to have an idea about human penmanship, but at the same time, I'm, I'm always quick to point out, regardless who the human instruments were, that really does not matter. We know that the Holy Spirit is the ultimate author of these books, and we know that because Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so whether the Holy Spirit led Samuel, Gad, Nathan, or others, it really does not matter. We know that he is the ultimate author of all inspired documents. And so that's what's most important. Now, number two, let's move from the authorship of these books and let's move to a, a second area that I've chosen to include in the introductory material. We have to say something about how Samuel functioned as prophet, priest, and judge. And the reason we have to say that, and this is already getting into what I dealt with uh, briefly from the syllabus a moment ago. Hey, we're, we're studying First and Second Samuel. We're going to be studying about men such as Eli and Samuel and Saul and David and, and, and numerous others. But make no mistake about it, we're getting four gleams of Jesus. We're getting four gleams of Jesus. And this is one such way... We know from the book of Hebrews over in the New Testament, we know that Jesus fills the roles of prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. The closest individual we have in the rest of Scripture that, that we, we can pin down and say, you know what, that he was awfully close to filling all three offices is Samuel. And it's as close as prophet, priest, and judge. He was technically not king, but he was prophet, priest, and judge. And that's awfully close to the work that we see in our Savior, Jesus Christ. He, he has filled and fills all three uh, offices or all three works, if you will. In chapter 3 and verse 20, we can see clearly that Samuel was established to be a prophet. And so that's the first office we've listed. Then over in chapter 7 and verse 9, we see Samuel's offering a sacrifice. And the Lord's hearing him, his sacrifice was accepted of God. And so that lets us know that Samuel also was a priest. And then finally, 1 Samuel 7 and verse 15 he judged Israel all the days of his life. And so three important offices there filled by none other than Samuel himself. And that makes him rather unique, very unique in Old Testament history. And so that, that's something we need to appreciate as we uh, study these two books. Now, second thing about the greatness of Samuel next Note his greatness as an intercessor, okay? Now, if we're talking about elements in prayer, or if you will, types of prayer, uh, someone list for us different types or different elements in prayer. There are at least five.
Okay? Let me get you started. Okay? What about praise? Is praise an element of prayer? Yeah. Thanksgiving, that's the second one. Very good. What's the next one? Okay, intercession. Typically, I, I would list it as fourth or fifth, but that's where we're going. Intercession. And so that leaves two basic other elements of prayer. Okay, petition, supplication, asking for something, and then the, the, the one, what do we do when we sin? Confession, confession, okay? And so when we're studying the elements of prayer, praise, thanksgiving, confession, intercession, and petition or supplication. So what does intercession mean? One of those five elements, what does intercession mean? That's right. That's exactly right. And so not all of our prayers, by any means, should all of our prayers be self-focused. Okay? We, we should spend a great deal of time. And in fact, we have many biblical examples uh, of men who spent a great deal of time interceding on behalf of others. That is, they were praying for other people. Now, there are two verses at least, and I think later on tonight I may add a third, I'm not totally sure. But these verses from outside of Samuel, they show us that Samuel was noted, he was known or renowned as an intercessor. One who could, who could come before God and plead the case of his people Plead their case before God. Here in Psalm 99 and verse 6, Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name, they called upon the Lord and he answered them. We're, we're going to read of some specific instances in the book of 1 Samuel where Samuel does that. He calls upon the Lord on behalf of the nation and God answers. Okay, So he, he was great as an intercessor. And then Jeremiah 15 and verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me. Though Moses and Samuel. Notice how they're held up as examples. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me. Yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight. And let them go forth. That's how deteriorated the condition had gotten in Jeremiah's day. You know, there would be times, and this is very very closely akin to that right here, there would be times when God would tell Jeremiah, I don't even want you to pray for these people. Okay? That, that's how wicked and how, how apostate the, the nation would be at some points in Jeremiah's life. Well, think about Moses here, because Moses is mentioned alongside Samuel. Were there not times in the history of the Pentateuch when God was basically ready to destroy Israel. And what did Moses do? He interceded. That's right. He pleaded their, their case. And notice that Samuel is listed right there by Moses. And so those are some things I want you to appreciate about the man Samuel. As we begin tonight and then as we proceed through this study. Uh, he not only functioned as prophet, priest, and judge. But he also was very great, great indeed as an intercessor on behalf of God's people. All right, let me make sure that I'm keeping up and moving along on my sheets as well. Now, that brings us to a third and a final section of our introduction. And after we cover this, I'll pause again if you have any questions or any comments. But what's really interesting, and for years I did not realize this. Okay, for years this, this had escaped me. But there is a good bit of material that is unique to First and Second Samuel. Now, what do I mean by that when I say it's unique to First and Second Samuel? What I mean is you don't read this anywhere else in the Bible. Okay? See, we're, we're accustomed as Bible students, we're accustomed to there being maybe a, a number of places where we can read the same account. Especially, for example, out of the gospel accounts. You know, you read a lot of the same stuff in Matthew that you find in Mark, that you find in Luke, especially those three. But, but even in the Old Testament, uh, you, you can read similar 
uh, accounts or, or just uh, companion accounts, say from somewhere in the prophets like the book of Isaiah to somewhere in the historical books like the book of Kings. And so you, you, we're accustomed as Bible students to reading a lot of material two or three different times in different places. Let me tell you, these items right here, if you miss them in Samuel, you're not going to read them anywhere else because they're unique to First and Second Samuel. Number one, the history of Eli and his sons. I don't know if you've ever realized this, but what we're going to read tonight and study tonight, Lord willing, from chapters 2 and 3, nowhere else. You, you wouldn't have any other record of that in the Word of God if it weren't for that account. Okay. Number two, the account of Samuel's life and service. Now sure, we've already noticed verses in Psalms and verses in Jeremiah. Samuel's mentioned by name in a lot of other places. But the only place we actually read about his life, his childhood, how he came up there at the tabernacle, how he was basically brought up after being weaned. He was basically thereafter brought up by Eli. The only place we find that information is here in the books of Samuel. Number three, the account of Saul's reign. Now, there, there is a, a caveat here that I need to mention. A, a portion of that, Saul's death, is, is mentioned twice. And so we read about that in 1 Samuel 31, and then we can find it again in 1 Chronicles 10. So that's one thing that is repeated. But a lot, the, 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 most, the bigger part of Saul's reign, we only read about it here in, in the books of Samuel. So that's important. And then number four, the history of David's life before enthronement. You want to know about the shepherd David? You want to know about how he was the least of Jesse's sons? You want to know about his life before he was King David? You've got to get it out of Samuel. Okay? Now, I'm pretty sure those four things are on the test. I'm pretty sure I want you to know and appreciate what makes First and Second Samuel unique. All right, let me pause for a moment and catch my breath. Do you have any questions or any thoughts before we get into chapter 1? All right, let's open our Bibles. Go ahead and open your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And uh, I have a, a subtitle normally for each of the chapters. As you can see at the top of your sheet there in your binder, we're calling this one Out of the Darkness. Out of the Darkness. And as we proceed, you'll see why I, I chose that title. I'll just go on and say now that Samuel is going to be a bright and shining light as he comes on to the historical scene for Israel. He's going to be a bright and shining light out of the darkness. Okay, And that's chapter 1. All right, let's look at chapter 1, first of all, on a personal level. As we do this, there are three major points that I want us to get. Point number one, as we look at this chapter on a personal level, we have to say something about the evils of polygamy. Something about the evils of polygamy. Now, what do we mean when we use the term polygamy? Multiple. Multiple. Typically, it's almost always wives. That's right. Multiple spouses, typically multiple wives being married to, uh, to one man. Now, critics of the Bible, they, they like to, to, to beat on this drum, so to speak. Because the Bible does contain many instances, many instances of polygamy. Going all the way back to the first book as we know it, the book of Genesis. And then at times throughout various portions of the Old Testament, we read about polygamy. But what we need to be very careful to understand and to properly understand and to appreciate is the fact that from the beginning, polygamy was never God's design or God's intended plan. Who makes that crystal clear over in the New Testament? 
Jesus. That's exactly right. Jesus makes that crystal clear. Uh, for example, in Mark 10, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus, he, he points people all the way back, not just to Genesis, because later on in Genesis, we're going to read about some polygamous families. And by the way, we're also going to read about the problems that, that existed in those families. And we're about to say more about that. But we read in the very beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, their creation, that God created how many women for Adam? One. One man, Adam, one woman, and for all time, for all time, that is the prototype. That startled me. That is the prototype that uh, God intended one man, one woman for life. All right, let's read here beginning at verse 1 in 1 Samuel 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, not Tofu, but Tohu now, the son of Zuth, and Ephraimite. And he, this Elkanah, had two wives. So automatically we see a departure here. We see something that is not the ideal. The name of one was Hannah, quite likely, quite possibly his first wife, and the name of the other, Penina. I'm, I'm saying Penina. They pronounce it differently. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there in Shiloh. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. Notice the multiplicity there. Okay? She had multiple sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, circle that word. Now I'm reading from the New King James. If, if I'm reading from the biblical text directly during this course, I'll typically, typically be reading from the New King James Version. The verses that I put on the screen and, and also on your outlines, if I remember correctly, I think they're King James Version. And so there may be a little difference there, but not much. But in the New King James, I want you to circle the word rival in verse 6. Anytime there is a polygamous marriage, sooner or later, that's what you're going to have. You're going to have rivalry between the wives. Okay, that's human nature. And that's also because polygamy is running counter to what God designed and what God intended. And so here, Penina is called Hannah's rival. She provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she, Penina, provoked her, Hannah. Therefore, she, Hannah, wept and did not eat. Think of this. The husband, Elkanah, loves Hannah more. He, he, he has a special place in his heart for Hannah, and he even gives her a double portion of the food that came off of the sacrifice, okay? But she is so upset, so provoked by her rival, that even though she has a double portion, what does she not do? She doesn't eat it, okay? And so you're seeing the unhappiness and the, the rivalry and the antagonism that is existing in this home. Verse 8. Then Elkanah her husband said to her. Hannah why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? In other words I really love you. Someone says well if he loved her. Why did he take this other wife? Assuming. Assuming that Penina was the second wife. And I think that's a pretty good assumption. And if so, then the answer would probably be simply to have an heir. 
He might have taken Penina simply because Hannah was barren, and of course he, he wanted children. That's a possibility. But anyway, here's what I want you to think about. We've already pointed out the jealousy and the rivalry that fills such homes. You can go back to, we're not going to tonight, but you can go back in your own studies to Genesis. You can read about the, the rivalry in the house of Jacob. When Jacob was married first to Leah, though unknowingly, and then to Rachel. And, and then later on you even bring in the handmaids uh, Bilhah and Zilpah. And, and Jacob winds up having sons by all four of those women. And, and you can read about the problems that came up. You can read about the problems not just between the women, the wives, but also the children. That's exactly right. The 12 sons of Jacob, you can read how they treated each other and especially how they treated the sons of the favored wife, the favored mother, if you will. So the evils of polygamy. Now, point number two here as we begin and as we get further into chapter one uh, we have to learn about the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Look here, continuing at verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow. Now this is important. We know that the, uh, the wise man tells us in Ecclesiastes that if you make a vow, what do you do? You keep it. God has no pleasure in fools, the Bible says. And so somebody who's going to make a vow to the Lord and then not honor that vow, God regards that person evidently as a fool. And so here this is serious. Hannah makes this vow and she said... O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Okay, That's indicating that Samuel's going to be raised as a what? Very good. Very good. As a Nazarite. Okay, no razor shall come upon his head. Verse 12, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. We've done, all of us have, have mouthed words silently without making any kind of audible sound. And that's what Hannah was doing as she was praying. Therefore, though, Eli, he assumes the worst. He thought she was drunk. You know, she, she's moving her lips, but she's not making any sound. She must be drunk. He assumed the worst, which is not good. Verse 14, so Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Apparently meaning I have spoken to God until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. Underline verse 17. Okay? Now, Eli is going to be seen clearly to have a lot of flaws himself. Nonetheless, at this point in time, he is still functioning as high priest over God's people. And so the reason I've asked you to underline verse 17 is because in this verse, the high priest over God's people, he speaks to this woman and he says, the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And knowing as it were the rest of the story, we're going to see that indeed God grants 
this petition. Now, notice some sub-points I have here on the screen regarding the power of prayer and some things we need to notice about prayer. First of all, it's important we realize that prayer can be spoken only in the heart. Okay? We, we don't have to audibly say anything. No, no kind of sound has to come out of our mouth for us to be praying. Now, I don't know about you, most of the time, I'm probably going to say 90 or so, maybe 95% of the time, I prefer to pray out loud. I like to be alone to where nobody thinks I'm crazy or you know nobody's listening to me pray, but I, I like to pray out loud. That helps me to, to hear myself praying, I guess you'd say, but by no means is that required. Anybody remember the example of Nehemiah? Notice there in Nehemiah chapter 2. Who was he standing before when he prayed to God? The king. He was standing before the king of Persia. And yet he prayed to God. So obviously that would have been a silent prayer or an inward prayer. So number one, prayer can be only spoken in the heart. God hears it. God knows it. And uh, based on his will and based on the faithfulness of the child of God, uh, God hears it, of course. All right, B, the pouring out of one's heart in prayer. Um, do we pray fervently? There in verse 15, when we read about how Hannah says, I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do you think that woman was praying fervently? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, now, I, I don't know you, I don't know your prayer lives personally, and I, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but I know people. I, I know myself. I, I, know, I know how we are or how we can be as people. And, and sometimes, sometimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves almost going through the motions in prayer. Okay, now I hope that's not the case. And all of us, we need to struggle and, and, and strive and, and work at praying more and more earnestly. But here with Hannah, that's what we have. We have an example of a woman who is pouring out her soul, pouring out her heart in prayer. And that just reminds you and me that our prayers need to be fervent. Remember James said in James 5 and verse 16, the effectual what? Fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? It availeth much. Okay. Someone says, well, I just don't feel like I'm getting a whole lot out of my prayer life. Well, there's a lot that can be wrong with that, and I, I can't diagnose every problem. But I can tell you this, if you're praying half-hearted prayers going through the motions, I know part of the problem. Because the Bible says they need to be fervent prayers. All right, let her see. Notice the benefits of prayer made in faith. Verse 18, we didn't read verse 18, but, but after Eli pronounced that blessing, if you will, upon Hannah, she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. In other words, may it be as you have said, in other words. So the woman went her way, and now notice, she's eating, and her face was no longer sad. What a wonderful example here. The Bible tells us to cast all of our cares. This is not on the screen there, but it's 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. But how many times do we cast our cares upon him and we say amen and we get up and we go our way, but we're still doing what? We're still carrying them. Hannah didn't do that here. That's the reason Hannah now, when she goes back to her family, she goes back and eats. And that's the reason why the Bible tells us there in verse 18 that she was no longer sad. Okay? James tells us in James chapter 1 uh, for us not to wavereth or not to doubt when we pray. For he says there, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. James 1, 6, 7, and 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You know, it's a form of double-mindedness. On one hand, to have enough faith to at least pray, 
Well, I'm going to pray. I know I need to pray about this. But then on the other hand, to step away and say, well, that didn't do any good. James says, that's double-mindedness. And he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And then finally, letter D here. Notice the beauty of a request that is graciously granted. Okay, Something I want you to know about God, and this is from Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Okay? I want you to know this about our God. Our God, by nature, is a giving God. That's his nature. You say, well, Cliff, how did I get that out of Matthew 7, 7 through 11? Remember, that's when Jesus had told the people there in, in preaching the Sermon on the Mount, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock. And the door shall be opened unto you. But then he goes into this illustration. And he says, which of you, and I'm paraphrasing now, but which of you as a father, if your son needs this, will, will you give him the, the exact opposite? Or, or if your son asks an egg, are you going to give him a, 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 a scorpion? If he asks for a fish, are you going to give him a serpent? And Jesus' point is that we as earthly fathers, though sinful Weak, limited, we're all that as people. But even though we're sinful, weak, and limited as earthly fathers, what do we strive to do? We strive to grant the needs and the request of our children. Jesus built on that. He says, look, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much the more? How much the more your Father which is in heaven. What he's teaching us there is he's teaching us about the nature of God. God by nature is a giving God. God by nature wants to answer the prayers of his children. Now, I'm not saying, and the Bible nowhere teaches, that prayer therefore is just a blank check. It's not. But he wants to answer the prayers of his children in the way that is best for our welfare. That's what's wonderful. Now that's the difference between God as our heavenly father and say, for example, Cliff Goodwin as an earthly father. I want to give and provide for my children, but you know what? I'll, I'll tell you frankly, I don't always know what's best. Sometimes I, I, sometimes I do. Other times, I think I do, but I'll tell you, there have probably been more than, one, more than one time when I've given something to my kids only later on to regret it and to say, you know what, I probably messed up. Probably shouldn't have done that. Okay? That's the difference. That's one of the many differences between me as a father or any of you men as fathers and our Heavenly Father. But that does not negate the fact that God wants to give. He wants to give. He just has the knowledge and the wisdom, the omniscience, to know how to do it best. You and I, we don't have that. All right. So there's some points there about prayer. Now this is interesting. Uh, I don't know where this came up. I think it comes up in, um, let's see, yeah. comes up in verse 20. Read verse 20 here of chapter 1. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. Now this, this is how we're learning about the background of why he's named what he's named. She says, I'm calling his name Samuel because I have asked for him from the Lord. The root, a possible root, you, you talk with some Hebrew scholars and men who study this type of stuff, a possible root of the name Samuel means to hear, to listen, to hearken. Who heard, who listened, and who hearkened? God. God did. Okay? He heard the prayer of Hannah. He listened to the prayer of Hannah and he hearkened to the prayer of Hannah. And so when this baby boy comes into the world, she says, I'm naming him Samuel because I have asked for him 
from the Lord and God listened. God hearkened. I'm naming my baby boy Sam. All right, point number three from this chapter. Now, we're looking at this chapter on a personal level, first of all. Personal level. Notice that a vow was paid. Now, there's the Ecclesiastes reference I alluded to earlier. If you make a vow to God, you pay it. God doesn't have pleasure in fools, things like that. So, you know, this is a big, this is a big thing. Hannah makes her vow to God and saying, Lord, if you would just give me a son, if, if you would just give me a baby boy, I'll give him back to you. I, I'll put him in your service for the rest of his life. Is, is that a sacrifice? Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Is, is that a woman that's desperate for a son? I think you can say that. Okay, We've already read about how Penina just rubs her face in it. All, every chance she gets. She, she knows that Elkanah loves her more than he loves her. But she can give Elkanah something that Hannah cannot. And that's sons and daughters. And so she just rubs Hannah's face in it every chance she gets. This woman is desperate for, for a child. And so she makes a vow that is very sacrificial. Very sacrificial. She's willing to give up. This child. Now, we do know from the book of Numbers, we know Numbers 36 through 9, that as the husband, Elkanah, if he came to know of this vow, or as he came to know of this vow, he had the authority to revoke it. He could revoke it as her husband, and she wouldn't be bound to the Lord to do that. It would, it would be revoked. But as her husband, if he approved it or if he just did nothing and let her go through with it, well, then it was binding. And it's obvious here that Elkanah, uh, if he did anything, he approved of it. And so this vow was binding. And then finally, you can notice there the sterling character of this woman. We won't read all of these verses for the sake of time. But needless to say, Hannah stands out among so many women in Scripture. Hannah was of exemplary character and behavior. And we see that especially here in chapter 1. All right, let's switch gears now, right? We, we've looked at chapter 1 on a personal level. We, we've seen briefly the household of Elkanah. We know that there are problems in that household, primarily due to polygamy. We, we see a barren woman, a woman whose womb the Lord had closed and how desperate she is to have a child. We see that, that this woman prays. We see that God answers her prayer. We see that she follows through with her vow. All of these personal heart-touching heart sentiments and realities. But number two, we miss the point. We miss at least another point if we fail to look at this on a national level. Now, a few times, especially in some of these earlier class sessions, uh, I come across some quotes that were so good that, that I, I put them on the screen, and I think they're on your outline as well. Uh, here, Bob Waldron said, Samuel was born some years after Samson. Okay, now Remember, when we were in the book of Judges, Samson was uh, among the last of the judges that we read about. Samuel was born some years after Samson. He was still young as a boy when Eli dies, and, and we're going to read about that in chapter 4. And he probably finished growing up during the years of Samson's exploits. And that's interesting. You know, you go back to Judges and, and you read about when Samson is, is killing a lion and when Samson is pulling up the, the Philistine gates and carrying them up to the top of a hill. And at that time, uh, Samuel is probably coming of age. He's probably growing up. But then sometime after Samson's death that we also read about in Judges, Samuel would see the defeat of the Philistines. And he lived a considerably long time after that. 
I, I don't know about you, but years ago when I, in my studies, when I came across that quote, that helped me. That helped me chronologically to start kind of piecing some of this together. You know, you've got Samuel's time frame, you've got Eli, you've got Samuel, and, and, or Samson's, Eli and Samuel. And it kind of helps us to, to see a theoretical, I mean, someone would say, well, that, that's hypothesis. Well, maybe so, but it's very, very plausible. It's very, very plausible. And, and, and the, the pieces fit together quite well using that and looking at that, as it were, as a backdrop. And so nationally, I want you to notice three things about the darkness of this period, okay? Number one, this was a dark period because of the oppression of the Philistines. You, you go all the way back to uh, Judges 13.1, and we learn that God has sold Israel, as it were, into Philistine oppression because they did evil in his sight. So any time, and I, I tried to stress this when we were in Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, any time national Israel of the Old Testament, any time they failed before their enemies, any time they were conquered or defeated, it was because of sin on their part. It was never because of a weakness in God, ever. It was never because God didn't keep his word to, to bless and prosper his people. Never that. Anytime national Israel under the old law, when they were defeated, it was because of sin. The reason that the Philistines are in the ascendancy, the Philistines are, are in control at this dark period, is because Israel is unfaithful. Israel is disobedient to God. Number two, another evidence of the darkness of this period is the corruption in the priesthood. We're really about to get into that in chapter two. And the, the priesthood's got some serious problems, especially with Hophni and Phinehas. But we're even going to see that Eli himself is, is problematic. He's got weaknesses and he's got flaws. And so there was corruption in the priesthood. And then number three, we're going to learn at the beginning of chapter three that there was a scarcity of prophecy. In other words, God was not speaking a whole lot through his inspired messengers. There was not an abundance of God's word. Now, you've got to keep in mind, the only books of the Bible that they would have had at this time at most would have been Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and perhaps, perhaps, Judges and Ruth, perhaps, maybe Job. Their, their Bible's not complete. It's nowhere near complete. And yet on top of that, God's not even giving them direct revelation through prophets. There's a scarcity of revelation. Why? Because of sin. Because of sin in the nation of Israel. So another quote here from Waldron. I, I used Waldron's commentator, uh, commentary a good bit. God blessed not only Hannah, but also the nation of Israel with the birth and life of Samuel. That's, that's why we're calling chapter 1 out of the darkness. Out of the darkness, this little light is born into Israel, and his name is Samuel. Samuel was reared and continued as a lifelong Nazarite. Some of you caught that a moment ago. Nazarites were considered one of God's blessings to his people Israel. They were intended as forces for good and they demonstrated a special level of holiness, a special level of consecration to God. It's interesting what you can find in Amos 2, 11 and 12. I'll let you read that on your own if you'd like about Nazarites. But, but Nazarites were considered one of God's blessings to his people. And now in this time of Philistine oppression, in this time of priestly corruption, in this time when there's not a whole lot of prophecy being given, God puts Samuel into that situation. And Samuel's going to clean up the priesthood. He's going to become a prophet who speaks forth God's word. And he's going to be there when God's people overcome the Philistines. And so on a national level, this is a whole lot bigger than just making Hannah 
happy. How many times do you and I maybe need to be reminded of that? It's a big picture. And, and you know, we've already talked about prayer, right? And we've talked about how prayer involves praise and thanksgiving and confession and intercession. But more often than not, probably most of our prayers are, are petitions for ourselves. Well, the big picture. I like the way you put that. We need to be more mindful of the big picture. For, for them back then, it would have been Israel of old under the law of Moses. But for us today, it's the Lord's church. It, it's the kingdom. And, and as we pray and as we serve God and as we seek his will, it's not just about what makes me happy. It's not just about my family, even though my family is important to God. There's a bigger picture than my family. And that needs to be reflected in the way we pray and in the way we serve. Now, you might be interested to know that throughout the Bible, we can find at least three lifelong Nazarites. The Nazarite vow that we read about in the book of Numbers, it did not always have to be lifelong. The, the Nazarite vow could be taken for a, a period of time, a definite period. But we do read of Samson, Samuel, and John the Baptizer. And by the way, I'm almost positive that's on the test. We read of three men in the Bible who evidently were lifelong Nazarites. Now, out of those three, if we're speaking frankly, which one did a sorry job of honoring his Nazarite vow? Samson. Samson is the quintessential underachiever. He was intended for so much more. Samson could have been so much more. He could have done so much more. I'm sorry? Sin died. Sin died. That's right. His own selfish desires, his own pride to the point of hubris, and you're right, sin got him. And he could have been so much more. Now these other two, hey, Samuel and John, what did Jesus later on, what would he say about John? Elijah to come, that's right. He, so he fulfilled that prophecy in Malachi. What else did Jesus say about uh, John? Before the church, that's exactly right. He says he's the greatest born of woman. But then he goes on to say, but he that is least in the kingdom or the church is greater than he. We enjoy a greater status than John did because of the, the, the kingdom. But still, I mean, they, these two here, Samuel and John, they, they lived worthy of the Nazarite vow. They, they were great examples. They were completers. completers? They completed their, their mission. Very good, yes. They completed their mission. Very good. Okay, it's 7 o'clock. We're ready for chapter 2. Uh, we've only got three more chapters, chapters 2, 3, and 4 tonight. And so, uh, if you will, we'll take a break. If you'd like some, I believe there might be some snacks. Yeah, there are some snacks and refreshments. Uh, let's try to limit our break till about 10 minutes. And so, we'll resume class at uh, 7.14. I've got 7.04, so we'll re try to resume about 7.14. All right, thank you.
All right, we're going to get started back here in just a moment. Uh, if you're on the stream, the, we're glad that you're joining us that way. I do want to say, um, as you notice, it was mentioned at the beginning, we have notebooks. So if you're watching the stream, we're streaming to um, Subsplash, which is accessible on our app. We're streaming to YouTube, and we're streaming to Facebook. If you're already on the app, that's good. If you're on YouTube or Facebook and you want this material, um, you can get it from the Edgewood building. If that's not convenient for you, um, then you can download the app, the Edgewood app. Um, it's on Android and iOS. You can download that and go to the GSOP tab and, and click on the class, and you'll see that there are attached documents. And so you can actually download um, these materials and use them at home. So I suggest that if you're watching that you that you that you grab the Edgewood app and use that to watch the stream and to get your material. I'm gonna give it back to Cliff and we'll continue forward. Thank you, brother. And also something that I did not do well, I don't think explaining a moment ago at the outset of class, um, by no means, by no means do you have to take this class for credit. Uh, last Last year, we had a number who audited the course, and of course, there are no requirements, there are no obligations to audit the course, and uh, if that's all that you're interested in this time, then we, uh, we certainly welcome that. We encourage that. Uh, if you are interested in taking it for credit, uh, and you have some questions about that, then afterwards, you can uh, definitely talk with Matt or with Lewis or others and you can find out more about the requirements, but that is not at all necessary. Uh, it's a blessing for all of us simply to be able to study the word together and to have that time and, and simply to audit the course. If you want to do that, that is certainly, uh, certainly welcome. All right, let's move on in our notes now to chapter two. I have that queued up as you see here on the screen. Our subtitle for chapter 2 is Knowing the Lord. Knowing the Lord. Now, the first portion of this chapter, and really a, a significant portion of the chapter, is perhaps remembered as the Song of Hannah, verses 1 through 11 here. And as we deal with the song tonight in class, we're going to use the, the preface statement, Hannah knew the Lord as blank. And there are going to be ten different ways that we can fill in that blank simply out of the song of Hannah. So how did she know the Lord? What did the Lord mean to her uh, basically is how we're, we're looking at this song. So begin reading with me here in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies. Now, think about the application of some of these things in her circumstance. You know, before Penina could say something ugly and Hannah would just turn and, and weep and lose her appetite and not eat. But now she can just look at her adversary and smile. She says, I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. How many times had Penina spoken arrogantly probably toward Hannah? Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble." The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he brings up. 
The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. That is, by his own strength or by human strength, no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Now, we skipped over some of those verses in the previous chapter where he was brought to weaning age, and after he had been weaned, then Hannah took Samuel to the tabernacle, to Eli, and just like she had promised to the Lord, she left him there in the service of Yahweh. Now, this song of Hannah or the prayer of Hannah, whichever you prefer, notice these ten ways that she knew the Lord. Number one, she knew the Lord as the source of her joy. You see that in the first part of verse one. Number two, she knew the Lord as her Savior or Deliverer. A lot of times in Scripture, these terms might be used interchangeably. We think of Savior and we think of salvation from sin. But, but that's not the only way that it's employed uh, in, in the Bible, especially if it's employed in the sense of a deliverer. God is able to deliver us from various problems, various trials, and various circumstances. Number three, she viewed God as holy. And, and the root meaning, of course, of holy is set apart. Now the reason for this, and I want you to pick up on this in verse 2, no one is holy like the Lord. What's important here is no one can do what God can do. God is holy in every way. He's set apart in, in limitless ways, but among those ways, He's set apart because nobody else can do what God can do. Has Hannah come to learn that by experience? Yes. Okay. And so she knows the Lord. And this is how she knows the Lord. Now, number four, she, she knows the Lord is her rock. And I did some study on this. And this was interesting to me. I had always thought of a rock as simply being... Stability, and it is. It, it, it has to do with stability. But, but something that I failed to realize about that, especially in the Palestinian or, or the southwestern Asian climate, a big rock was also a refuge from the sun. If you were out in a deserted area, uh, there just weren't many trees perhaps not any trees, especially in the desert areas. And if you came across a large rock, if you got on the right side of that rock, it gave you something that you could not find anywhere else in that desert. It gave you shade. And so in times of flood, you know, they would have a lot of flash floods. If you could get up on top of a large rock, it would give you stability. But in times of, of heat and, and out in the deserted areas, it would give you shade. So when she said that God is her rock, she's emphasizing refuge. Whichever figure you prefer. Uh, stability in a time of rushing waters or shade in a time of heat. Either way, God is her rock. God is her refuge. All right, number five. As she's describing God, she knew the Lord as one who knows all. He knows everything. Number six, he's also the just 
judge. The just judge. You know why he's just in his judgment? Because he knows all the facts. Did God know how Penina treated Hannah? Well, of course he did. Did God know how Hannah's heart broke and, and was, uh, was terribly saddened? Of course he did. He's the just judge because he knows all the facts. Now, none of us can say that. I don't know all the facts in every case. I don't know all the facts probably in any case. But God does. Now, in verses 4 through 8, some of those various descriptions there about the, the hungry now have ceased to hunger and the full have hired themselves out for bread. The, the barren has borne children. The, the one with many children has become feeble. All of those various descriptions we read all the way down through verse 8, the big picture is God is the one who can reverse situations. If God were not the one who could reverse situations, would he be able to save us? No. That's part of our salvation. Colossians 1 and verse 13, he can reverse our situation. He hath, trans, he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1 13. He's the God who can reverse situations and so we learn that from Hannah's song as well also in those verses he is sovereign over all the earth what does the word sovereign mean possessing what total and absolute authority that's right he is sovereign over all the earth is anybody's authority above God's no that's silly that is silly Okay? And so we, we see that. Number nine, he is man's necessary strength. We, when I was reading, I think it was verse nine a moment ago, for by strength no man shall prevail. I pointed out that's man's own strength. That's human strength of any kind. If I'm only relying on myself or I'm only relying on other people, I'm not going to prevail. The one whose strength we've got to have is the strength of the Lord. And then finally, verses 9 and 10, he is the keeper of his people. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, so I want to share it with you briefly. In the Bible, and especially in the King James Version, if you're reading from the King James Version of the Bible, do you know what the word keep often means? It means to guard. To guard. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Proverbs 4 and verse 23, Solomon would say, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What Solomon's saying is, guard your heart with all diligence. Don't let sin enter in. Don't let evil thoughts enter in. Don't let error enter in. Guard your heart. The word keep means to guard. And then over in the New Testament, Philippians 4, Philippians 4 and verse 7, And the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds, or the peace of God that passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. That word keep means to guard. The peace of God guards our minds. It guards our hearts. And so when the Bible speaks of his being the keeper of his people, that is God is able to guard, watch over, protect his own people. All right, do you have any thoughts or any questions on the song of Hannah or how it was that she knew and regarded the Lord? Any thoughts or questions? All right, let's move on to section number two here on our outline. And this is the latter two-thirds or so of the chapter. Here's where we're going to learn more detail about the corruption in Eli's family. Now, Eli is the, the sitting high priest at this point in Israel's history. 
And so that means if there's corruption in his family, there's corruption in the priesthood. And that's extremely problematic. And here's where we're going to learn about some of that. Look with me here at verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Get this. Eli's the high priest, but his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they are priests themselves. They're not the high priest, but they're underling priests. Keep in mind, the law of Moses, the Levitical system, you would have a multiplicity of priests. They would all be of the house of Aaron, and at, at, at one time, typically, you would have one high priest, but there were a lot of priests under him. And so what we just read in verse 12 is we're reading about two priests at the tabernacle who don't know whom? Hmm. Is that something we can preach and teach? You better believe it. We're going to say more about that here a little bit later. Verse 13. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust that flesh hook into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. Think about that. If you've got three hooks, there's a pretty good chance you thrust that into the pot and, and drag it through. You're, you're getting a lot of the sacrifice. Okay? He would keep it for himself. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, that's not the only problem. Also, before they burned the fat, which the fat always was supposed to belong to God, as at least the bulk of it as I recall. Before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw meat. And if the man said to him, They really should burn the fat first. You should do that first. Then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would answer them, no, but you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. So what are we reading about in your own words? What are we reading about in these verses right here, 12 through 16? What were they doing with the sacrifices? I'm sorry? Okay, they are degrading the sacrifices. They're, they're taking for themselves what they shouldn't be taking for themselves. And, and if you're a worshiper in Israel, if you're a worshiper in Israel and you've brought the best, uh, under the law, weren't they expected to offer the best? So you bring your best calf or your best lamb or your best goat, whatever. You bring your best and you're doing this because you want to worship God. You, you want to honor God. But instead, you stand by and you watch this guy misappropriate, misappropriate what you've brought to God, and he winds up taking for himself some things that he has no right to. Now, there, there were portions of various sacrifices that the priests did have a right to, but those were laid out. They were specified in the Pentateuch, okay, especially in the book of Leviticus. And so apparently these men, they're just disregarding what the law of Moses says back in the Pentateuch about the, the uh, proper handling of the sacrifices. Like Tristan said, therefore they're degrading the people's sacrifice. But if you're the worshiper and you've brought your very best to give to the Lord and you have to stand and watch this corrupt priest take something that does not belong to him, that happens a few times and then how do you start feeling about worship. Are you itching to go worship God? No. See, they've just become a stumbling block to you. Because God wants us to be eager to worship Him. God wants us to be joyful in giving, sacrificing to Him. God wants us to have the right attitude. But we got to admit, for all of us, it would be awfully hard to have the right attitude when you see how it's being degraded and misappropriated, right? 
And so that's the problem here. All right, let's look. Number one, Hannah is an example of a woman who knew the Lord and she knew so much about the Lord. Here are two priests, Hophni and Phinehas, that don't know the Lord. Number one, the first thing they don't know and understand is the holiness of his worship. When, when men come before God to worship God, is that supposed to be serious business? That's always serious. See, there's a movement. I'm just going to go ahead and say it for the benefit of everybody, whether present or online or whatnot. There is a movement in modern American, especially American, quote, Christendom, where a lot of groups and so-called churches, they want to turn worship into some kind of concert. Okay. Let me tell you, when it comes to worshiping God, that is serious business. You don't just come before God and just do whatever you want to do. You don't just show up and, and act as though God's worship is Burger King and you can just have it your way. That's not right. You can't do that. Now, look at this principle from Leviticus 10 and verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh unto me. By the way, in worship, do you know you're doing that? In worship, you're coming nigh unto God. We're approaching God with our worship. God says, all right, I will be sanctified. I will be regarded as holy in them or by them that come nigh me in worship, the idea. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. What had just happened in verse 2 of Leviticus 10? Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, had just been killed. They had just been burned with fire before God. You know why? Because they corrupted God's worship. Worship is not a plaything. Wor worship is not just an open field, an open ground. Just do what you want to do. You know, turn worship into some kind of uh, audio visual experience or whatever, a pyrotechnic. What? Uh, uh no. <laughs> and I, I know what I'm saying is not popular, but I'm telling you biblically. Worship matters. It matters that we do what God tells us to do. We do it God's way. And so here you've got these two priests now, priests, and they don't know this. They don't understand nor regard nor appreciate the holiness of God's worship, number one. Number two, they also don't know and regard and appreciate the value of God's people and their relationship with God. Okay? So verse 17, Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. Why was this such a terrible sin? For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. It got to where people resented going to the tabernacle. Nobody wanted to go worship God. Nobody wanted to go give God their best. Nobody wanted to, to, to show their, their gratitude and their praise and, and thanksgiving to God in worship because these sorry priests are abusing their privilege. So verse 17 says that they're a stumbling block to the people, and that's our little bulleted point here. It is a great sin. We know this is taught throughout Scripture it is a great sin to be a stumbling block to others. Hey, it's bad enough. If I choose sin and I want to live in sin and I want to do wickedness and be lost, that's bad enough. But then when my behavior undermines the faith of other people and drags other people away and causes other people to stumble, that is even worse. And then number three, something else that those priests did not know. They did not know God's ways. They did not know his morality. Look at verse 22. Skip down to verse 22. Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did 
to all Israel. So he'd heard the way that they were manipulating those sacrifices and how they were strong-arming the people. But then on top of that, he heard how they lay, and that is to lay sexually, how they lay with the women who were assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And so here's an order of women, apparently, who ministered there at the tabernacle. They were apparently devoted in some way to the service of God at the tabernacle. And these two priests were sleeping with those women. So, verse 23. So he, Eli, said to his sons, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. You're being a stumbling block to others. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. The Lord what? But the way it's worded there, the Lord desired to kill them. Simply from the standpoint, God desires to bring his judgment. He's going to bring his judgment on their deeds. And the fact that they will not repent, the fact that they will not listen to their daddy, the fact that they will not change, is just show, showing and saying that God's judgment is coming. It's going to come upon Hophni and Phinehas. Now, we've talked about the boys, but now let's talk about Eli's involvement. Because I've told you earlier, even though Hophni and Phinehas were grievous sinners, Eli is also involved in this. Okay, Look at verse 29, and we, we can gather from verse 29 a few thoughts. In verse 39, God is speaking to Eli through a, a prophet. Uh, let's back up to verse 27. Then a man of God, that's a term for a prophet, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel my people. Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me. For those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now that shows us that a lot of times God's promises are conditional. A lot of the, a lot of the promises that God makes might be conditional promises. In other words, as long as man does this, God promises that. But if man no longer meets this condition, then God's promise is no longer in effect. And we, we see that really throughout Scripture in various instances. Three things here about Eli's involvement in the sin of his sons. Number one, we learned that he too had been disrespecting God's offerings. We pick that up from verse 29. Number two, he honored his sons more than God. You know, this is hard for parents to hear. But when parents refuse to correct their children, it shows that they are choosing their children over choosing God. And in this way, they're honoring their children more than they're honoring God. Now, what's interesting is these are grown sons in this instance. Okay? Hophni and Phinehas are grown men. But Eli is still the high priest. And so as the high priest, in a sense, he's over all Israel, in a sense. But he won't even correct or rebuke 
his sons beyond what we read. He, he makes a feeble effort at it in verses 23 and 24, I guess. But with God, God's saying this is not enough. Number three, he along with his sons, he saved the best of the sacrifices for themselves. We read about that there in some of those verses. All right, do you have any questions or any thoughts about Eli, his sons, or their shortcomings and their wickednesses? Wickedness. <laughs> any thoughts or comments? All right, before we leave chapter 2, there's a few additional lessons that popped out at me when I was putting this lesson together. Number one, we, we learn from this chapter that there can be people sitting in worship, we might say sitting in the pew in our day and time, who have never known, never embraced, and never internalized God's ways. Is that true or false? It's true. I mean, right here, you've got two priests. You've got Hophni and Phinehas, descendants of Aaron. They're, they're, they're rightful as far as their lineage is concerned. They're rightful priests. They're, they're living and serving at the tabernacle, and yet they don't know anything about God. They don't know anything about God's righteousness. They don't know anything about God's worship. They don't care anything about God's people. And what's so sad is we have folks sitting in the pew. Still today it's possible somebody might come and sit in the services of the church and they've never known God. They've never embraced or internalized His ways. And that's why we keep preaching. And preaching and preaching and preaching because in hopes that the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, will do what? Prick their heart. That's what we hope. And we keep preaching and preaching. Number two, none of us can ever outgive God. None of us can do that. Someone says, man, what Hannah gave to the Lord was a great sacrifice. Well, that's true. But some of these verses that we skipped over, look at verse 20. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, the Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their home, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And so here, sure enough, her firstborn, she sacrifices and gives Samuel to the Lord's service the rest of his life. But the Lord winds up giving her what? Three sons and two more daughters. None of us can ever outgive God. You'd better believe that. We need to trust that. Number three wrongs against God's people are wrongs against God himself. Is that true? It is true. What's very sobering from the New Testament, Acts chapter 9, we know that Saul of Tarsus for a while, he was public enemy number one against the church. Saul of Tarsus. And remember when he was traveling to Damascus to persecute more Christians, that Jesus appeared to him in a light that was brighter than the noonday sun. And does anybody remember what Jesus said to Saul? Why don't you do it? Me. That's exactly right. Saul, Saul, he didn't say, why persecutest thou my people? Even though that was right. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Because see... What we do to the Lord's people, we're doing to him. Hophni and Phinehas, when they were causing God's people to resent the worship, they were sinning against God. That was a very, very serious thing. Number four, those in authority must take discipline seriously. In this case, it would have been Eli as the high priest over Israel, and yet he did not discipline his own sons. He did not discipline the underling priests who were under him. But we know that those in authority, whether it's parents, whether it's elders in the local congregation, whether it's civil rulers in government, those in authority must take discipline seriously. And then number five, God honors those who honor him. 
He honors those who honor him. I, I love James 4 and verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith God resisteth the proud. Anybody who's too proud to need God, anybody who's too arrogant to submit to God, God says, I resist you. If you don't want me, if you don't come to me, then I'll resist you. But he gives grace unto whom? Unto the humble. Those who would bring themselves low before God, he will lift them up. All right, let's move for the sake of time. We better move on. Let's move into chapter 3 now. I, I love this chapter from the standpoint that we can see and we can talk about the grace and the mercy of God. Remember that there were three reasons why this period in Israel's history was a dark period. Number one, you had Philistine oppression. Number two, you've, you've got corruption in the priesthood. But here's where we learn about that third reason. It was a dark period. And that is you had a scarcity of the word of God. Okay, you didn't have a whole lot of prophets that, that were out preaching and teaching God's word at this time. Look at how chapter 3 begins. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. In other words, he lived there at the tabernacle. He's doing whatever Eli as the high priest tells him to do. He's a minister. He's a, an attendant or a servant boy. He, he, he's there serving the Lord in whatever ways uh, are deemed fit. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Now that's the first statement. There was no widespread revelation. I, I have here on the screen one, two, three, four different translations, four different versions for that last part. Okay, We're, we're just operating from the New King James the word of the Lord was rare in those days, the first part. But then the last part says there was no widespread revelation. Another version says there was no frequent vision. When you read vision in the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, vision has to do with revelation. God's revealing a vision, as it were, to his prophet. But there was no frequent vision in these days. Young's literal translation says, There is no vision broken forth. In other words, this revelation from God that, that man would desperately desire perhaps, it's not breaking forth, it's not coming through. Now, the reason for this is what? Sin. That's right. Israel is not right with their God. Their loyalty, their devotion to God is not what it should be. And thus, they're suffering a judgment from God. The scarcity of His Word was basically a judgment from Him. All right, there, this means there was not an abundance of public preaching coming from inspired prophets. There, there was not. Now, we did read back in chapter 2 and verse 27 about a man of God. We did read about a prophet who came to Eli and basically told Eli, Eli, your house is going to be judged because of your wickedness. But keep in mind that that was private. That was a private thing basically just told to seemingly one man. There's not any public preaching by inspired prophets or at least very, very little if any at all. Number one, under that, keep in mind that these opening chapters are set in the time of the Philistine oppression. We, we've already brought that out time and again. Number two, and I've already said this earlier tonight, whenever Israel lost to her enemies, it was because of unfaithfulness on her part. On her part. And, and so that, that's the reason, that's the backdrop as to why there's such a famine or a shortage of God's word. Why? Because of sin. And that's why the Philistines are in the ascendancy. And that's why everything is haywire. Everything is bad. Now, I would like to tell you that this would be the only period in Israel's history 
when, when God calls there to be a famine of his word. But it's not. Hundreds of years later, look here at the screen with me to the book of Amos. Later on in Amos' day, notice what God would again say. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. But God says, I'm not talking about a famine of bread, a lack of food, nor a thirst for water. But I'm talking about a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. You're not going to be able to hear my words, I'm going to cut off the prophets. I'm not going to send the visions. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And so even in Amos' day, God would judge his people and punish his people. Uh, then later on in the captivity. In the captivity, it comes up again. Ezekiel, remember, was a prophet in the captivity. And again, basically the same thing. Mischief shall come upon mischief. Rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet. They're going to wish they could talk to a prophet. But the law shall perish from the priest. And counsel shall perish from the ancients. There's not going to be anywhere to turn to get God's revelation. The king shall mourn and the prince shall be clothed with desolation and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way and according to their deserts will I judge them and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, let me ask you a question. I thought God, I thought God wanted people to have his word. True or false? That is true. He does. So how do I reconcile that? If God is a God who wants people to have his word and he wants people to hear his word, then why would God cause a famine of his word at various times? Why? Okay. There's a principle, Thomas, and you're exactly right. There's a principle that we express with this, this saying. Use it or... There it is. And that's number three down here at the bottom. There is a very sobering principle given by Jesus. Uh, I'm going to bring this up. This is in Matthew 13. You can look at it on your sheets or on the, the screen with me here. A lot of people read over what Jesus said and they don't, they don't catch, I don't think, the full import of what Jesus was getting at. The disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Lord, why did you choose to, to talk in parables at this point? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. I believe it was McGarvey who in writing on this and commenting on this pointed out that Jesus did not start out his ministry. He did not start out his ministry teaching in parables. Think about that. Near the beginning of his ministry, for example, we have the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, is some of the most straightforward teaching you could ever ask for. And McGarvey pointed out that when Jesus was teaching in a more straightforward manner, those who received it, those who grasped it and, and embraced it, they were prepared and they were in a position that when he began speaking in parables, they were ready to receive it. But guess what? Guess what? When Jesus was preaching in, in a more straightforward fashion like the Sermon on the Mount and you're sitting there listening to it just as plain as day and you turn and say, well, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want that or not. Then guess what? When he started preaching in parables, guess what you're not ready for? You're not ready for it. That's a sobering thought. And Thomas, you hit it right. The reason God, who wants people to desire his word, he wants people to seek his word. But 
when, when he gives his word and they say no thanks. No, th you know, God's given his word, but they ignore it. He says, okay, well, I'll take it away. And when he takes it away, sometimes, sometimes, we hope that they desire it again. Another saying that maybe helps us to appreciate this is, sometimes you don't know what you had until what? Until you've lost it. That's right. Another lesson learned. All right, very good. So number two now, let's talk about the burden of God's word. We've talked about the famine of God's word, chapter 3, 1 and following. But now picking up at verse 10, let's talk about the burden of God's word. Now this is one of the most familiar accounts from uh, Samuel's life. He's a young boy, he's, he's there in the tabernacle with Eli, and, and God calls out to him in the night. And the first three times that God calls out to him, what does Samuel do? First three times he gets up and goes where? He goes to Eli. He says, Eli, you called me? And Eli's like, son, I didn't call you. Go, go lay back down. And that happens three times. Well, finally, the third time, the Bible tells us that Eli perceived, look at verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time, so he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Eli, I know you're calling me. I've heard you. Then Eli perceived that it's actually the Lord that had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, we might say if he calls you again, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. Verse 10, now the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And instead of getting up this time and running to Eli, Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In other words, this is going to be news that, that people can't believe it when they hear it. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house. We read a little bit about that back in chapter 2. All that I've done concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. He did not discipline his own sons. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning, and he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Apparently that was one of his jobs, is to open up the, the doors to the tabernacle. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. If God had given you that vision during the night, would you be eager to, to tell it to Eli the next morning? You would? I don't know that I would. <laughs> do, now, I mean, sometimes, sometimes we might, but typically do we like to be the bearer of bad news? No, and, and really, for, for a while now, this man has been Samuel's father figure. Because he's not able to live at home, right? He's not able to live with Mama and Elkanah. And so th th this has got to be a burden. See, the, the Bible speaks of God's word sometimes as be. It uses the word burden. And what that means, number one, is when the word of God is called a burden, it's talking about a negative prophecy concerning a nation or an individual. Now, we need to notice that God does not make what? He don't make threats. Okay? If God gives you a burden, if he, if he says something negative, that's the way it is. He, he's not making idle threats. And so a lot of examples of this, we won't read these for the sake of time, but, but there's one in 2 Kings chapter 9. Number two, a faithful messenger of God's word has to preach concerning judgment. True or false? So I've been preaching 27 years at, at Ironiton, right? Would I have done my job 
if over the past 27 years I never preached about sin, I never preached about judgment, I never preached about hell, I never preached about God's holiness and God's just, would I be doing my job? No. Now, what Samuel's about to learn right here is still a youth. He's a young, but he, he now at this point he's a young prophet because this is his first prophecy that God gave him right here. What he's about to learn is that if I'm going to be a spokesman for God, sometimes I got to talk concerning judgment. Okay, everything is not love, mercy, peace, grace, and joy. I love those things. I love those things, and that's certainly uh, in the will of God. But the will of God tells us about other things as well. And that, that's part of doing the work of a preacher or in the ancient times of a prophet. You know 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. And I look, in preaching you have to reprove, rebuke, but you also have to exhort or encourage. And you do all of it with long suffering and teaching. That's the work of a gospel preacher even in our day and time. And so, number three, if we're going to do that, faithfully preaching God's word, would you say it requires courage? I've told young men before, and I'll say it again, and, and I, I'm not anything special. Okay? I'm, I put on my shoes uh, one foot at a time just like everybody else. But I'll tell young men or old men, if you don't have the courage to say what is right and what is wrong based on the Bible, please don't preach. You don't need to be a preacher. Be something else. Be a computer programmer. Be a doctor, a lawyer. Be something. But if you don't have the courage to say what the Bible says about anything, don't preach. You've got to have the courage to call, what we say, call a spade a spade. In other words, that it is what it is. And we've got to say what the Bible says it is. All right, section number three here. Notice and let's end this, this chapter on a very good note, a positive note. Let's say something about the overcoming nature of God's grace. Read the last three verses of chapter three with me, picking up at verse 19. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. So the first prophecy Samuel's given is a very negative prophecy. It's a burden concerning Eli. And the young boy didn't want to tell it. Many of us might not have wanted to tell it. But he, he did tell it. And thereafter God stayed with Samuel and he let none of his words fall to the ground. What does that mean? That's right. That means that whatever God gave Samuel as an inspired message to preach, that when Samuel preached it, God fulfilled it. He let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, now look, this chapter opens up at verse 1 telling us that there's no widespread revelation. There's a famine of the word. There's a scarcity of the word in the land. But now it closes by telling us all Israel from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, they came to know that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Finally, we got some more preaching. Finally, God sent us somebody that will, will tell us his word. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. That sounds like the Lord had left Shiloh, doesn't it? The Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Folks, the people of Israel did not deserve a leader like Samuel, but God gave them anyway. What do you call it when God gives us something we desperately need, but we didn't deserve? What's that called? Grace. That's called grace. <laughs> and that's this chapter, chapter 3. The grace and the mercy of God. Okay, there are some there, verses there telling us about how Samuel functioned among the people, how he helped his people. Number two, God's grace furnished prophets to Israel under the Old Testament. He gave them prophets because they needed to hear his word and hear it preached. 
His grace provided apostles under the New Testament. You know, the Bible that we have, the New Testament particularly that we have, it's because God gave us apostles and New Testament prophets who wrote down those scriptures. And if God had not given us those leaders, had not given us those men, we would not have God's word today. But thank God we do. Thank God we have it. And so in a sense, we could apply this statement from Romans 5 and verse 20. But where sin abounded, what did grace do? It did much more abound. I'm so thankful that we have a God who according to his wisdom, according to his will, as he sees fit, he gives us what we need sometimes even when it's not what we deserve. He gives us what we need. So that's a great thing. Here's some additional notes. Now these are not on your outlines. So if you want to write these down, I'll leave them up just a second. Um, God's people were not very close to him during this period of their history. This strained relationship is reflected in the fact that there was no widespread revelation furnished to the nation at this time. In the previous chapter, we noted a prophet had come to Eli, but remember that was private and personal in its nature. But now from this point onward, Samuel would be used by God in a very public capacity. Inspired revelation would once again be available to the nation at large. Do the people need that? Yes, they need that. All right, one more chapter. We got about 20 minutes. It shouldn't be a problem. Tell me what you think about this title. What do you think I mean when I say God in a box? What am I talking about? I'm sorry? Okay, that's pretty good. Take, take him out when you need him. Yes, very good. Okay, so under the law of Moses, the nation of Israel did have a box of sorts. I, I mean, no disrespect. But what was it called? Very good. Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box made out of shatim wood, overlaid with pure gold. It had to be tremendously heavy. It was tr to be transported by four men with poles through the rings of the ark, and they would th bear the weight of that ark on their shoulders. That's the way it was supposed to be transported. Later on in 2 Samuel, we're going to read of a time when God's people were not transporting it correctly, and it cost a man his life. What was his name? Uzzah. Okay. But anyway, this Ark of the Covenant, it looked like a large golden box. And on the lid of it, there were two cherubim, some type of angelic creatures that had been fashioned. And apparently with their wings open, they were turned kind of facing one another. And, and what was that called between the cherubim? Mercy seat, very good. Seat of mercy, the mercy seat. And, and so the Ark of the Covenant, it symbolized God's presence among his people of Israel. Well, God gave that. That was his will. That was a good thing. But what's not good is when Israel stooped to the, to the low level of thinking, well, if we have the box, we have what? We've got God. You know, if we've got the box, we've got God. No, 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 no. Whether or not you have God doesn't depend just on the box. It depends most of all on your what? Your relationship with God. That's right. Your heart, your, your life, your obedience, your faith, your love. Okay, so that's where we're going. Look at uh, chapter 4. Let's read the first four verses. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and they encamped beside Ebenezer and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel and when they joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines because their hearts are still not right with God who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp following this loss, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? 
Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us so that when it comes among us, it, circle this now, you, you can't make this stuff up, it may what? Save us from the hand of our enemies. You think they got God in a box? They think they got God in a box. That's right. They think they've got God in a box. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim there on the mercy seat and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Folks, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Okay, Number one, they misunderstand the nature of God. Number two, I don't know if you caught this who did they, they blame their defeat on in verse 3? Who did they blame their defeat on? The Lord. Why has the Lord defeated us today? Before? So they're acknowledging that God is allowing them to get beaten. But then they go on to say as if they, they're like, well, we'll twist God's arm. If God's going to defeat us, then we'll, we'll just show God. We'll go get the box, and we'll bring the box to the battlefield, and then we'll win. Can you twist God's arm? No. Now, the reason I say further, this is a disaster waiting to happen. What two scoundrels are accompanying the ark? Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons. That's right. Hophni, so, I mean, it's going to go downhill from here. Number one. Israel's problem was not strategic. In other words, they didn't lose to the Philistines because their battle plan was inferior. That's not why. Number two, neither was it superstitious. They didn't lose because they didn't carry the ark the first time. They could have carried the ark the first time and they still would have lost. Their problem is spiritual. Their heart and their lives are not right with God. That's why they're losing. It's not a strategic problem. It's not a superstitious problem. It is a spiritual problem. Now remember, if we're linking this to the, the life of Samson, and we think that Samson, Eli, and Samuel, they all kind of overlap a little bit in time frame, the problem goes back to Judges 13.1. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. I believe we're in that 40 year period at this point. If I'm not mistaken, I think we're still in that 40 year period when they're losing to the Philistines. Okay, there's some more verses. Number two, Israel's problem was a problem of the heart. They were not loyal or devoted to Yahweh. You don't find that till chapter 7, but in chapter 7, verse 3, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you. Put away these idols. Were they supposed to have any idols? No, that's the problem. Put these things away from you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve Him only. And if you'll do all that, He will deliver you from whom? The hand of the Philistines. Okay, So that's their problem. They were not loyal or devoted to the Lord. All right, section number two now. We've talked about the real cause of their failure. Now let's talk about the problems with Israel's thinking. It's evident that Israel thought the ark's presence, let's just go get the ark and, and have it present with us, was going to solve their problems. Is that the way God operates? Does God give us a, uh, a, a lucky rabbit's foot? That as long as we keep the lucky rabbit's foot in our pocket, we can sin and act like heathen? No, he doesn't do that. And yet that's what they're thinking. The ark's presence is going to solve our problems. No, it's not. Number two, Israel's misplaced emphasis on the ark furthered the erroneous thinking of the Philistines. Now, think about this in terms of the church today. Is the church today supposed to be the city set on the hill? 
Yes. Is the church today supposed to be setting an example to all the people outside the church? Yes. yes. Well, think about Israel that way. Israel was supposed to be the city on the hill for that dispensation. They were supposed to be setting an example that would help the Philistines understand God, not cause the Philistines to further misunderstand God. But that's exactly what happened. So move down to verse 6 here. After Israel goes and they get the Ark of the Covenant, verse 6, Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, because Israel shouted when they brought the Ark into the camp, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood, oh, that the ark of the Lord has come in. Uh-oh, they went and got that box. Israel went and got that box, y'all. We're in trouble. So the Philistines were afraid, verse 7. For they said, God has gone into the camp. No, he's not. Say, right here. Because of Israel's misplaced emphasis... Now they're furthering the erroneous thinking of the Philistines. God's not in that camp. They might have gotten the Ark of the Covenant, but God's not with them because of their sin. But the Philistines say, well, he's there. He's come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. You know, Israel's never brought that box before. Every battle we've ever had against Israel, they didn't bring out their God in a box. Verse 8, woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? And so they, they misunderstood God's presence. Now they're still thinking that Israel serves multiple gods. Did, did it, was Israel ever supposed to serve multiple gods? No, 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 no. Monotheism, not polytheism. Monotheism. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So according to verse 9, even though they're initially scared, apparently they, they gather their composure and they're like, all right, we've got to go do this. They might have their God in a box, but, but we've got to be men and we've got to stand up and fight this. And so they conclude that they can defeat Israel's God. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they died that day. And so even though it's misled and even though they're, they, they're not getting it right, the Philistines go home that night thinking they've done what? We've beaten Yahweh. We've beaten the God of Israel. God's like, I'll let you win. But they don't understand that. See? All of this misunderstanding right here. And instead of making it better, Israel only makes it worse. That's right. All right, number three, let's talk about God's judgment on the house of Eli. Remember that had been foretold back in chapter 2. It was given to Samuel in a prophecy in chapter 3. But now in this chapter, it comes to pass. The judgment had been foretold. Now it's going to happen. Number two, Eli had warped priorities himself. So look at verse 12 of chapter 4. Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day that Israel loses and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. Now when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching or waiting for his heart trembled for the ark of God. He's trembling because they took the ark into battle. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? 
So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Now, there's a lot to digest right there. But out of learning that God's people have fled and been defeated, out of learning that your two sons are dead and gone, and out of learning that the ark has been confiscated by the Philistines, which one do you think mattered the most to Eli? That's why I say he's got warped priorities. It wasn't his sons. Notice what the text says right here. Then it happened, verse 18, when he made mention of the ark of God. It's, it's not that Israel's lost the battle. It's not that my sons are dead. But when he made mention of the ark of God, that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. Okay? As far as Eli was concerned, it sounded like he might have thought God was in a box. Because, man, if the enemies take the box, what are we going to do? Eli, you're a spiritual leader. You ought to be more concerned with turning people's hearts to God. If you got their hearts turned back to God, everything would work out. But he's, he's got warped priorities. Evidently, he must think something about God in a box as well. Number three, there's a similar warped perspective in the widow of Phinehas. Look at verse 19. Now, Eli's daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was pregnant. She was with child, due to be delivered. She was due any day. And when she heard the news, not, well, that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, so that these things do factor in, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, so she dies in giving this, this birth. About the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because, this is why she thinks the glory has departed from Israel. Because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Here's why that's messed up. Now, anybody would be upset to lose their husband and their father-in-law. That's understandable. But this is messed up because the glory had been departed from Israel for a long time. The glory had departed from Israel because Israel had been unfaithful. Seemingly that had never bothered her. But now that the box is gone, yeah, now, now the glory has departed from Israel. She, people are misinformed. If you've ever preached or worked with people any length of time at all, sometimes you just shake your head at how people can just miss the point. They can just miss the whole point and have, have, things, uh, have things out of whack, so to speak. So let's close by making a modern day admonition and application. We're talking about God in a box. What are some ways that we might put God in a box today? Well, what about baptism? Now listen, the Bible teaches baptism is for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. The Bible teaches that baptism is essential to salvation, 1 Peter 3, 21. The Bible teaches all of that and more about baptism. But what if, what if we settle for baptism without belief, without repentance, without confession? You know what you've done? You've put God in a box. You've put God in a box. You, you're, you're saying that baptism can save regardless of your heart, regardless of your penitence, regardless of your belief. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches it takes all of the above, that we must believe, we must be penitent, we must confess, and we must put on the Lord 
in baptism. What about church membership? Now, now get, get, hear me. The Bible teaches that the saved are added to the church. Acts 2.47. The Bible teaches that when Jesus comes back, he's only going to deliver up the church to his Father. The Bible teaches that. Church membership, and I mean membership in Christ's church, is absolutely essential. But you know what? If you just say, well, I'm a member of the church, and you don't live it, you, you don't have a, a life of faithful service, loving the Lord, trusting the Lord, doing what the Lord says, but my name's on the roll. I'm a member of the church. What you've just done is you put God in a box. You put God in a box. Number three, what about the Lord's Supper? Some places, and folks, this, this really gets on me a little bit, <laughs> but we've all seen this, but some places, if people can get in service long enough on Sunday morning just to take the Lord's Supper and then hit the door, they feel like they've punched their ticket for that day. Okay? And listen, the Lord's Supper is absolutely to be observed every first day of the week. I believe we can make a strong biblical case for that. Absolutely it's supposed to be. But is that the only thing we're supposed to do on the first day of the week? Well, no. And so if, if, if we have the idea that, hey, I, I, I'm going to go play golf this afternoon, but before I go play golf, I am going to swoop in and I'll be there for the Lord's Supper. I'm going to take the Lord's Supper now because I'm a member of the church. See, we start stacking them on top of each other. <laughs> I'm going to take the Lord's Supper because I'm a member of the church who's been baptized for the remission of my sins. And then we ain't living like any of it. Okay? And pardon my English, but we ain't. We ain't living like any of it. Well, then what you've done is you've put God in a box. See, all three of these things are absolutely vital and essential. All three of them. But not a one of them, apart from heartfelt devotion and faith, is worth anything. You've got to live your Christianity how? From the inside out. I'm sorry? Sincere and genuine. Sincere and genuine. That's right, Thomas. All right. I, I ran us right up to the time. Did, does anyone have any thoughts or any questions before we wrap up? Yes. Yeah, I thought, just real quickly on the, uh, the family of the Word in the Old Covenant. Yeah. David, that, that is a sobering thing to consider, is it not? I pray all the time that God bless Yeah. Well, see, as long as we stay humble and sincere and submissive before God, we don't have to worry about that. But, but exactly, in that reference there, 2 Thessalonians 2, what, what you're citing is 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. You read on, and the reason they are sent the strong delusion is because they receive not the love of the truth. They don't love the truth. And I tell you what, if we ever get to a point that we don't love the truth, we don't want to hear the truth preached, we don't want to practice the truth, we don't want to defend the truth, if we ever get to that point, you better watch out. Because you are then vulnerable for a lot of delusion if you don't love the truth. Yes, Tristan. Absolutely. He got it. Um, that, that's a great comment. You know, earlier I said if you work with people long enough, sometimes you'll just get to where you just shake your head because you don't understand why. They, and, and that attitude there will make you just shake your head. You know, e either we love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, or we really don't love the Lord at all. What you got, Brother Curtis?
I think it's some of both. I think it's some of both. I think among the common people, brother, there, there was always, for some reason, and we, we could get into those, there would be many, but for, for several reasons, apparently, there was always a pull among the people toward idolatry. I mean, there's a pull toward it. Maybe it's the, the sensual worship services that they participated in or whatever, but there was always a pull toward it among all the people, it seems like. But then the leadership did not step up to curb that like they were supposed to do and to, to guide people, God's people in the right way. And so I would say it involved both, both sides of it. Yes. Every time. Yep. Very good. Very good. Well, look, let's, let's bow for a quick word of prayer. I've, I've held us already to our time. Thank you so much for being here. And Lord willing, our next session will be next Monday night, 6 o'clock. Let's uh, bow and pray together. Father, we love thee. We're so thankful, Father, that you love us. And that you have sent your son Jesus to take away our sins. Father help us to just put our trust in him. And to submit wholeheartedly to his will. Knowing your love and your power. And we thank you Father for the opportunity to be your children. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.